this morning? Oh, are you kidding me? You guys doing all right this morning? Dude, you're going to have to wake up. Come on, Wimberly, wake up. Hey, guys, we have a very special guest with us this week. He's been here uh, since Sunday night, and uh, I've gotten a, an opportunity to spend a lot of time with him and visit with him, and, and uh, um, <clears throat> he is, uh, he's written a book uh, he, several years ago entitled Kingdom Education that is totally changing the way I see education. Um, after 20 years of education, I, I think I was looking at things uh, the wrong way a lot. And so um, he's totally changing the way I look at it, and I know many others here at our school, the way we see education. Uh, he is the uh, husband of one wife, uh, the father of three children, and the grandfather of six children. He uh, has just recently retired as the superintendent at Sherwood uh, uh, Academy in Albany, Georgia. Those of you that have seen movies such as uh, uh, Fireproof, Courageous, Facing the Giants, uh, this is the church where he is also, I believe, your executive pastor? Yes, sir. Yep. Associate pastor uh, there. And so he's very, uh, very uh, um well known in the uh, Christian school circles, and we are very, very excited to have him here and very privileged, and he's going to share a word with you today. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Glenn Schultz. You're dangerous right up front. <laughs> are you required to sit here, or do you choose? You choose. That's even good. That's even better. Good morning. Where, where are the seniors? All up front. I'm impressed. Uh, my oldest granddaughter is a senior this year at Loganville Christian Academy, so I, I'm getting used to being around seniors and things like this, so I appreciate that. I, I want to talk to you uh, today about something I think is really critical. Now, you, you're singing all about this passion uh, to know God and, and all this that I, I heard you uh, lifting the praises up to Him, and I, I just want to ask, do you really want to please God? Well, I, I see heads going, all right? And, and uh, you know, how, how do you please God? Now, we, we've got to have some participation. So I, I'm going to ask those two young people who are leading us in music to come back up because I understand, you know, you're the sharpest kids in school and you got all the answers. So come on up here, all right? And, and your name is? Melanie. Melanie, okay, and you're a senior. 
And, and your name is CJ. Okay, what's that stand for? Caleb. Caleb Jerome. I've got a CJ grandson, and he's Colby John. So, okay, so CJ I'll remember, all right? Okay, all right. And, and what year are you? You're both seniors. Okay, so these people really, they know everything, right? So I can ask questions. So I'll let you hold that, and then you guys can just share it and things like this and speak right up into it. So you want to please God? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> what does God say in his word pleases him? When we obey him. When we obey him. What verse is that? <laughs> okay. All right. A anything else? Can you think of any verse that would say, well, this pleases God? Okay, okay, all right, because it's nice putting you on the spot, right? Because uh, I, I didn't tell them. We didn't prepare or anything. Can you think of anything that tells you without it, it's impossible to please God? Faith. Faith. Where, where do you find that? Any idea? <laughs> it, it's, it's in a book where there's a chapter all about faith and about people of faith. Called, sometimes called the Hall of Faith. I don't know that book. Oh, <laughs> well, do you know the book? We're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. Boy, you know, <laughs> in, in this, aren't you glad you're not up here? But now I'll bring you up. Okay, it, it's Hebrews. Hebrews. Okay, Hebrews. All right, good. <laughs> good, good job. Now, Hebrews 11.6, here's what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You believe that? Why do you believe that? Because God said it. Okay, because <laughs> God said it. It's in his word. All right. So it's, is it mean it's difficult to please God without faith? Impossible. It's impossible to please God without faith. So we've got to have faith. We've got to live a life of faith. In order to please him. And you want to please him. So tell me what you think faith is. I'm not asking for each of you. Just tell me what you think faith Don't move away now. Stay <laughs> over here. Okay. D t tell me, you know, if, if you're a l little elementary child came and says, I, I want to know what faith is. Because it's impossible to please him without it. So what is faith? Don't come up with a deep spiritual <laughs> answer. Just how, how would you explain it to someone? It's putting our trust in God's grace to help us out with what we need. Okay. Putting our trust in God's grace. How would you define it? I mean, trust is a good word, but like a child, like the Bible says to have childlike faith. So I guess just trusting in things that you think that you It's a word that we use a lot, but what you're saying is we use it, but we don't think about what it really means. If I could share with you a very understandable, practical definition of faith that you could actually put into practice, knowing that you would please God by living that, would that be helpful? Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. All right, thank these people. All right. I, I often wondered to myself, how, how do I please God? And, and, well, I've got to have faith. Well, faith, what is faith? What, what, well, it's putting your trust in something. Is it putting your trust in faith? What is it all about? So I want to go and take you into the Old Testament, and I want to share a couple stories with you, and I will want to give you a definition of what I believe true faith is. And with that, I guarantee you, you can please God. If you go to 1 Kings, if you have your Bibles, if you don't, we just listen up. I want to go to chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17. And it's the story of a man named Elijah. How many have heard of him? Anybody in here? A few of you. Okay. Uh, Elijah, it says, is a Tishbite, and, and he uh, comes from Tishbe in Gilead. 
And here's what it says in verse 1. Elijah said to King Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, now I want you to understand what that means. Can you imagine if you're sitting in your chapel seat like this, and all of a sudden you hear some rustling back in the back, and you hear the doors open, and there's a little group of people come in, and, and all of a sudden you turn around, and a man has walked down this aisle, and when you turn around, it's the President of the United States. And he walks up to you, and he puts out his hand. What would you say to him? Howdy. Howdy, because it's Texas, right? It's Lubbock. Howdy. What, what would you say other than howdy? You said howdy. Okay. How many of you, if the President of the United States walked up to you, put his hand out, you would step back, put your finger in his face and say, I want you to know something, Mr. President. It's not going to rain in the United States until I say so. I mean, do you understand that? This is the first time Elijah sees this king. And instead of saying, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, what a pleasure it is to meet you. I'm humbled to be in your presence. He puts his finger in his face and he says, king, it's not going to rain until I say so. Now, now, how could this man say that? To understand it, you've got to go back into chapter 16 and listen to what it says about Ahab. In verse 30 of chapter 16, it says, Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He did not only consider it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worshipped him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple, in the very temple where he's supposed to worship God. He sets up this altar to Baal. It's interesting. Baal is the weather god. Uh, th that I find ironic. And, uh, and then he goes and he, uh, he also set up this temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. He also made an Asherah pole and, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of him before him. He was pretty wicked. But then this verse is in there. And it says, In Ahab's time, Hiel the Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up the, its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Here's a verse. It's talking about this wicked king. And then all of a sudden it sticks a verse in. This guy goes and tries to rebuild Jericho. And when he lays the foundation to rebuild Jericho, his one son dies. When he goes and sets the gates in place after he has rebuilt Jericho, his second son dies. And you say, where does that fit in? Here's how it fits in, young people. And listen to this. Elijah lived in Gilead, which was up in the mountains overlooking the ruins of Jericho. Now, you've got to understand, what, what happened at Jericho? What happened? The, the walls fell down. You know, it got destroyed. God destroyed it. It had laid in ruins, not just a few years. Jericho fell in 1550 B.C., 1500 years before Christ. Elijah doesn't come on the scene until about 800, 850 B.C. So 600 plus years, Jericho has laid in ruins. And, Josh, and, and Elijah, living where he did, he could see the ruins. All of a sudden, he starts seeing a group of construction workers show up, and they start rebuilding this. And all, they're, they're getting ready to pour the foundation, and there's a work stoppage. And Elijah hears that. This guy's son died. Then he starts seeing the workforce start going again, and they get ready to put the gates in place. All of a sudden, a work stoppage, another funeral procession. And Elijah says, hmm, 
God's word is true. Because, see, if you go back to Deuteronomy, which was the, the law at the time, and, and Elijah would have had those books, and you go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11, here's what God says. Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will shut the heavens so that there be no rain. Now here's what Elijah did. Elijah sees, you know what? Here, Jericho has been in ruins for 600 years, and all of a sudden, Someone tries to rebuild it, and what God said back in Joshua 6, 26, cursed be the man who tries to rebuild this. When he does lay the foundations, he's going to have a son die. When he sets the gates in place, he's going to have another son die. Elijah says, you know what? God's word's true. So Elijah goes and says, well, Ahab has done more to anger God by turning the entire nation over to worshiping Baal. And God said back in Deuteronomy, when that happens, my anger will be kindled against you and I will shut up the heavens and there won't be any rain. So Elijah says, good, I'm going to go tell Ahab that. And he walks up to Ahab, he says, it's not going to rain until I say so. And what he was doing, he was acting by faith. Because here's what faith is. Faith is acting as if God's word is absolutely true regardless of the circumstances. I have that imagination that I believe it was probably thunder and lightning in the air when Elijah said that to Ahab. Here Baal is the weather god and he's going to go and say, guess what, it's not going to rain till I say so. Why would he have the boldness to do that with maybe clouds in the air and, and, and wind rustling and things like this? Because God's word said it was going to happen, and he saw that God's word was true regarding Jericho, so he did that. Now, let me, let me prove that to you. If you go a little bit further in the story of King Ahab, or, or Elijah and Ahab, we get to chapter uh, 18, where Elijah, after three years of drought, there has been no rain, just like he told King Ahab. He challenges the prophets of Baal to come up to Mount Carmel and let's have a little contest and see whose God is really real. And he says, you build an altar and you pray to Baal and you call him down to bring fire down to the altar. And you know what he did. You know, they were yelling. There was 400 prophets of Baal and they were yelling and screaming and calling down. Nothing happened. Elijah was a little bit sarcastic and started teasing him. And he says, hey, yell a little bit louder. Maybe they're, your God's sleeping. Maybe Baal's sleeping. Wake him up. And they cut themselves. They did all this stuff. Nothing happened. He says, you know, hey, maybe he's in the restroom. Go knock on the bathroom door. See if he's in there. He, he really gave them fits. Nothing happened. So then it gets Elijah's turn. And Elijah goes and repairs the altar. And you've got to understand now, it says in, in chapter 18, they called for all the nation of Israel from all across the land to gather. I don't know how many there were. There could have been millions of people. There could have been at least a million. They're, they're watching this. And we know the story of what happened. Elijah prays, and what happens? God brings fire down from heaven. He goes and he not only burns up the sacrifice, he licks up the water because Elijah dumped, you know, seven buckets of water in a drought over this sacrifice and it's wet wood and everything else. And listen to what it says. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood. It burned up the stone and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they fell fr prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is a sound of heavy rain. I want to ask you. I understand you've had a lot of rain here lately. You know, had some thunderstorms. 
if I came to you and said, hey, we got to get out of here. I hear the sound of a real loud storm coming. What do you think I would be hearing? What? Tornado type things? What would you hear? If I said I hear a sound of a big storm. Thunder. Some people will say, well, you'd hear lightning. No, you don't hear lightning, but you may see lightning. You'd hear thunder. You'd hear the wind blowing and things like that. Wouldn't you agree that that must have happened? Well, listen to this. Elijah is up there on Mount Carmel. He tells his servant, I want you to run down to the sea and tell me what you see in the sky. The servant runs down to the sea, comes back up. He says, sky is perfectly clear. What did Elijah hear? He says, well, you go back down there. He goes back down there a second time. Sky is clear. He goes back the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. The seventh time he goes down there, he comes back up. He says, well, Elijah, there, there's a cloud over the sea the size of that. Size of a man's hand. And Elijah says, go tell Ahab, get out of here. It's going to pour. Now, if you walked out and looked out in the sky and you saw a cloud that big, would you run for cover? No. You say, it's not going to rain. It hasn't rained in three years. But before he did all this, Elijah says, I hear the sound of a big storm. Get out of here. In fact, it says that the power of God came on Elijah. He tucked in his tunic and he outran uh, Ahab in his chariot all the way back to Jezreel. So here's the question. What did he hear? I think it's found in verse 39. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate on the ground and they cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Uh, how many of you have been, when they won a game, to a Texas Tech football game at their stadium? Okay? Have some of you been there? Have you ever been there when the, when the stadium's full? Any, anybody? I just want to know. A and they're winning. Okay? Does the crowd get loud? Is it deafening? How many does that stadium hold? Anybody know? How many? 60,000. Okay, so 60,000 people yelling for the Red Raiders, it can be deafening. Can you imagine what the sound of maybe a million people crying out to the Lord is, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. In fact, let, let's try it here. Everybody, okay, now you got to participate or, or else this weekend you got to come in and go to class all weekend, all right? Okay, so you, you, you just follow me. The Lord, He is God. Come on, come on. The Lord, He is God. No, louder. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, louder, 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 louder. Okay, and guess what? Elijah says, I hear rain. I hear rain. Because, see, back in Deuteronomy, God says, when you return and worship me, I will send rain. Now think about this. The sky is clear. The circumstances don't tell you it's going to rain. There's no way it's going to rain. But he says, no, let's get out of here. I hear the sound of rain. And here's what Elijah was. Elijah was a man of faith. And he said this, I am going to live as if this word is absolutely true, regardless of the circumstances. The circumstances says it's not going to rain. But God's word says it will rain because my people are worshiping me. Elijah goes up to the king and says, it's not going to rain three years earlier. And the circumstances would say, you're crazy. But Elijah says, no, I'm going to act as if God's word is absolutely true, even when the circumstances don't support that. Young people, that's faith. And without that kind of living, it is impossible for you and me to please God. When the Bible says, I'm holy, so therefore you say, 
stay sexually pure. And the culture says, no, do what you feel like doing. You're going to say, no, I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to act as if God's word is true, even when the circumstances don't support me. When you get out there in life and God says, listen, you give me the first tenth of everything I give to you and I will bless you. And you say, I can't afford that. The economy is bad. It doesn't make sense. You live it as if it's true. When you go and get to that point where you stand before a pastor and you make a vow to give your life to a husband or to a wife, till death do you part, even when the circumstances don't support that, you are going to live that because you're going to trust that God's word is true. Why? Because God's character stands behind everything he says. Young people, what I want you to know is when you please God, God blesses you. And, and you cannot please him until you're willing to live a life of faith. You know a lot of Bible being here in a Christian school. Are you willing to go out and live as if it's absolutely true, even when the circumstances that hit you don't support what this says? Are you willing to live? You won't experience faith until you do that. Father, our time's been short. I want to thank you for the attention these young people have given me, a stranger. My words mean nothing. Your words mean everything. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will burn truth into these people's lives. I pray that students sitting here would understand the truth of this book that says if we do not repent of sin and accept what your son did on the cross for our sin, we will go out into an eternity of hell. I know the circumstances of life don't support that, but that's a reality. And I pray that if there's someone who sits in this school day by day but doesn't know you as personal Lord and Savior, they won't let a day go by without Doing, walking through that plan of salvation and understanding who you really are. I pray that those who know you will actually not just study this book in Bible class as some story, but they realize it's, it's based on your actual character and what you say is true and it is trustworthy and that they would pattern their whole life after it. May you bless them in everything that they do. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.